Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. Ladies and gentlemen, your host for the House of Hardcore podcast, Tommy Dreamer. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the House of Hardcore podcast. I'm your host, Tommy Dreamer, and this week I have Impact Wrestling's own. He's a somebody, Jake something. What the hell is going on? Hey, what's up? <laughs> Hi, buddy. You look like a, a normal person. I've never seen you really like with your hair not up and, I mean, it's not down. You look like a regular, well, you kind of look like you're also in prison with windows. Yeah, this is my prison, my bedroom. Nice. Uh, I ask everybody when they come on the show, what got you hooked in the wonderful world of professional wrestling? Um, I guess I can't specifically tie it down to like a specific moment, but my family liked wrestling. So it's just, I've always, always watched it. My uncles had uh, tapes of Ric Flair and like pictures with him and stuff like that. My aunt actually, she had long blonde hair and the joke that they actually convinced me when I was a kid and I was very stupid was that um, she was Ric Flair's sister. So I thought that for a while. But uh, yeah, so I've just always, always wanted to be a wrestler and always been hooked on it. You know, all, all of the typical ones, Hulk Hogan, Stone Cold Rock, Triple H, all those. So you grew up in, I don't want to say the Attitude Era, but you grew up uh, late 80s, early 90s? Uh, I was born in 89, so through the 90s. Right. Mm -hmm. Holy crap. I've had an entire career by the time you're born. <laughs> yeah, I was watching old. you. I was watching you when I was a little kid, staying up way too late on uh, Passport, <laughs> 3 a.m. <laughs> um, so, okay, so you're a fan. What made you decide you want to get into professional wrestling? Um, no, so that's another one of those things that I've just always – wanted to be a professional wrestler so like in first or second grade when the teachers asking everybody what they want to be i was like yeah pro wrestler and then just every year it stayed the same and then even in high school when you had to go to like the counselor and figure out what classes you wanted to be in to pursue your career i was like well i'm going to be a pro wrestler so i don't know you know i don't think we have any classes here for that granted drama i did that but <laughs> But yeah, that was just always the game plan. So I saved up money in high school and then went and got trained uh, as soon as I graduated. Who trained you? Uh, Ring of Honor. Really? Yeah, yeah. Um, and at the time, like, I honestly just Googled uh, wrestling schools and that was like one of the top ones that came up. I'm like, oh, what's this? And I'm like, oh, this is crazy. <laughs> like, what the hell? Um, yeah, and it was like 14 or 15 hours away and I just kind of packed everything in my car and went and moved i was like ready to live in my car but um i found a lady to let me rent a, a room from her and you moved from where to where uh michigan so uh, i'm like near saginaw and i moved uh to i'm trying to remember the name of the town newtown pennsylvania it was about 50 minutes from bristol that's where i trained bristol pennsylvania right next to new jersey and who were your trainers delirious um and then, like the the upper upper guys that were on Ring of Honor that always helped out were uh, Rhett Titus, Grizzly Redwood, uh, Sugarfoot, Hagedorn would come in a lot, mostly mostly doing office stuff. But uh, and then he had guest trainers and stuff come in too. Like Austin Aries came in, um, Hero came in. Wow, I never knew that about you. Yeah, I thought you were. Uh, I actually thought like you would be a Michigan guy slash like either. Scott Demore or uh, Truth Martini. Don't know if he had a school then, but I thought you were trained out of Michigan. You should, you should have been trained by Bastion Booger. Duh, Saginaw, Michigan. Come on. Now. <laughs> well, I like I said, I googled them and I was like, oh, I guess this is a a good school. It's real, you know, it's the closest one. Didn't realize Scott Demore school was two and a half hours away, and uh, House or <laughs> the um, House of Truth was two hours away. I was like, ah, all right, you got me, but whatever. <laughs> I got hooked up with Scott later, so. Yeah. Um, 
okay, well, I didn't know you were a Ring of Honor guy. And like I, I interviewed Rhett and he had told me Austin Aries was his trainer. Uh-huh. And uh, that's pretty cool that I knew that they had a school, but I didn't know who they produced. Uh, pretty cool that you were one of them because you are a really, really good in-ring worker. Um, did you work a lot for Ring of Honor? No. So that, especially at the time frame, um, cause I think that their, their whole business model is much different now, but like uh, a lot of the guys that trained there at the time, they didn't really go on to work there much. Um, Rhett, Rhett is probably one of the major exceptions. Um, but a lot of the times, like, you know, they just end up being ring crew and, and whatnot. But I think now it's much different. I think now it's like, uh, you know, you go and train there, um, like almost like a developmental system yeah. type thing. Cause I think they, they signed a lot of their trainees um, when they were you know doing that. But yeah. So it, it was, it was much different. That should be the catch. If you have a wrestling company that's on television, you sign here, you will eventually work your way up to be on television. I know like yeah. that's what I was doing with house of hardcore shows. I had wrestling school. Uh, hey, you're going to get on these shows. The company blows up. You'll be part. You'll be on the ground floor, and that's how it should be because they're homegrown uh, talent. <clears throat> I'm trying yeah. to think where the first time I met you as a wrestler was. I want to say it was a Scott Demore show. Yeah, I believe it was. Um, they had that show in at the Diamondback Saloon. I think that was the one. Um, I don't think I was signed with Impact yet but I was doing impact shows if I remember right. And you were in a tag team, correct? Wait, then maybe I met you sooner than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, were you in a tag team? I was, I was in the tag team the first like five years of my career. Um, and he actually trained, we trained together at ring of honor. Like uh, he's uh, one of my buddies from my hometown. So we like moved and did all a that muscled together. up dude with like a dark beard. Right. No, I think, mm-hmm. I wonder who you're thinking of. Carm? Are you thinking of Carm? Who are you talking about? <laughs> uh, his name is Brandon. His wrestling name was Donnie. I don't think that you would know him. You'd be surprised who I know, Jake, something. I oh, know that's a lot true. of people. That is true. <laughs> He's not muscled up, though. <laughs> He's All right. skinny. He's a skinny loser. <laughs> Hit the gym, bro. Um, yeah. Okay, so yes, I do. I remember that show um, and you were working different events. Uh, obviously, you're doing the whole indie scene uh, before you get picked up by uh, Impact Wrestling. When did they offer you a contract? Um, let me see. 2018. I'm, uh, the, the actual year is shaky. It was right before Christmas, though. But by that point, I had been like doing work with them for about a year straight like uh when they were still in orlando i hopped in a car um like hoping to get on and then i had a squash match against bobby lashley and um it like he liked it a lot so he kept pulling me over to people telling them to sign me and stuff and he was being very awesome and then i got booked on like the next loop maybe um and yeah and that was when like Jarrett and everybody was still there and then then i started like they started traveling a little bit and i would do like the shows that were nearby um with cody one of the times and then ah months later kind of just like not not super random but like i got a a phone call from scott and i was like oh what's this <laughs> and then he offers you a deal yeah I loved uh, you and Cody as a tag team. I yeah, it was very your, fun. Your, your skits that you guys would do were friggin' hysterical. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of like backwoods, all about pro wrestling. And just you guys had a lot of comedic timing where mm-hmm. he's Cody Diener this you know but and you're kind of like the dumb were you his brother or cousin cousin yeah and it was just i love so much i remember i had i had pitched that uh man what was it because cody couldn't come across because of the border yes and you were on the border and like i remember i wanted to pitch like you guys waving to each other across the bridge (laughs) and then i wanted to do like this whole 
like trying to get where you guys would come together. But then like, there's also, he, I don't know, there's legal things with visas and all that stuff. So we couldn't like mm-hmm. make light or make joke of it just because of just in case they did watch it. Yeah. You're, you're going to get in trouble. Uh, I remember the whole, my, when he was so lost without you, um, mm-hmm. and he was doing like the action figures. Oh, they were so, so good. <laughs> yeah. I forgot all that stuff happened too. And I don't know if they actually aired on television, but I remember watching them all and I was frigging in love with it. It was, yeah. And Cody, you and Cody would come up with a lot of the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. He had like, cause obviously that's his whole deal. So he, he fired off a lot of those ideas and whatnot right. too. But uh, yeah, it was very fun to be along for the ride. There was one of the, one of the skits that we did, it was like shortly after we first signed um, and we were at the ECW arena actually. And the little thing we were doing was we went to one of the like popular uh, Philly steak places and Cody was Cody's usually like a one and done promo guy. Like he fires them off. It's easy peasy. But in this one, while he's firing off a promo, I'm just smashing a, a cheesesteak and it's huge, but he just keeps messing up. So I'm like, really? Like, and I eat a lot, but like by this point, I like devoured like two of these things and like cheese fries and like a huge drink. And I'm like dying. I'm like, you have to, you have to finish this. This has to be the one. The behind the scenes things that people don't uh, know about. Yeah. I actually did um, when I was doing the eating stupid stuff. Uh, we were doing a pre-tape and I was eating dip before a match that I had with a uh, big boss man. And I think it's cause Bruce was praying a rib on me. He kept on making me do it over and over again. Mm-hmm. And I was legit drinking tobacco. Uh, it wasn't spit, but it was wet tobacco that looked like spit. And I don't chew, but man, you do get sick. And also big boss man had a weak stomach. And uh, he was like, he couldn't be there. So we don't even talk about our match. And he was like, uh, I'm going to throw up. Uh. And I was like, he's <laughs> like, if I throw up, you beat me, roll me up as I'm puking. And if not, like I take the boss man slam. And he was like, we'll just figure it out there. And like, here I am nervous as can be, even though I've wrestled everybody. But man, you're... You, you've been this. You're wrestling someone who you grew up watching on television. Yeah. I'm wrestling the big boss man. And I don't know my finish. And I don't know if he's going to get sick. And as I'm walking to the ring, <laughs> I start getting lightheaded. And I was like, I tell the ref, I go, tell him if I start to throw up, he could pin me. <laughs> That's all we had. You can find this match somewhere on Heat, by the way, uh, on YouTube. Anyway, um, you and Cody, uh, a good mid-card tag team. I think they could have done a little bit more with you guys. Um, I feel there is, I don't want to say during COVID, but lack of fans. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say hurt certain wrestlers. I do know it hurt one wrestler because he gets over doing the things that he does in front of fans, and that was Willie Mack. Mm-hmm. Like, Willie, when they watch him live, they're like, holy shit, this guy's amazing. Without fans, I don't think it resonates because, right, right. you know, as you know, as a performer, you, you don't, you feed off of the audience. For you and Cody, I think you would have had a bigger run pre-pandemic or if there was no pandemic because fans would have rallied behind you guys because you were so friggin' entertaining. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then of course Cody has to go and join a cult, bastard. <laughs> as as you would. Yeah, I mean that's normal for most. And now you're you're on your own. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I'll tell you how I personally felt about you for a while. Nothing mm-hmm. behind the scenes. You as the performer, I would say you were a sixty forty guy. And what I mean by that. I will watch you and I've been blown away on some of your indie stuff. And I'll be like, holy shit, this guy's the next bruiser Brody. This guy's the next guy. And then I'd see you sometimes on TV and I'd be like, where was that guy then? Mm -hmm. And like, when I say 60, 40, it's like, I want to see that 60% as opposed to that 40%. Yes. 
And then up and, and, and I'll tell you this, like, we all say this in impact. They're like, man, this guy could be a star. This guy could be a star. Now, when I work with you, I just see the star and I see this bruiser Brody character. I like, you're, you're a mix of a lot of people in my head. Um, you're like a caveman meets bruiser Brody. At times you have, you have a uniqueness quality about you. Um, I think also fans don't know you are very rare, very regimen on your eating. Um, I see you all the time, like with your <laughs> meal prep and all that stuff. And, and that's the sacrifice that a lot of people pay because mm-hmm. you want it. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, I was super impressed and, and yeah, I was your agent, but you and Chris Bay frigging tore it up. You're also super duper strong, uh, which strength they'll always say at times strength doesn't play in wrestling, uh, up until certain parts as well as like, I also at times you remind me of Randy Savage cause you're super agile for a guy. You're a big dude. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you have like, I don't want to say a favorite or somebody you want to try to emulate, or this was just like ring of honor mentality, high spots, high spots, high spots. Uh, no, I guess, honestly, my all time favorite wrestler is triple H. So move wise, I don't necessarily do his moves, but like the way, the way I actually move in the ring is like kind of from him. So like the way I bump and feed the way I, like run and you know just things like that the way i sell those are like that's the guy i watch a lot for that that kind of stuff but um obviously he doesn't do power stuff so i have to like cherry pick from other things interesting yeah i've never seen you hit a pedigree no no i do always always steal his uh you know he'd always go for a pedigree and have the guy back body drop him yeah like all right there it is the very very (laughs) easy easy thing to do and it, it seems to be over every time and every person who was trained by Killer Kowalski knows how to take the flip bump to the floor slash oh, okay. like sit on the top turnbuckle and you bump mm-hmm. China, Triple H, Perry Saturn, Frankie Kazarian all take that great um, bump amazingly because that was like a Killer Kowalski 101 special bump. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Hey there, auto mechanics and super cool do-it-yourself guys who work on their own cars. I'm going to tell you about rockauto.com, the online store with every auto part at the best possible prices. This is your one-stop shop for everything auto parts. Rockauto.com has been in business for 20 years, and they make it easy to find parts you need at the best possible prices. No more talking to counter guys who need to order parts, aren't really sure what you're looking for, never have quite what you need. And then after all that hassle, they still charge you storefront markups, those sons of bitches, at rockauto.com. You can easily find everything you need. And whether you're a mechanic, an auto shop, or working on your own car, everyone has access to the same incredible pricing at rockauto.com. So if you're a car guy right now, go to rockauto.com and check out all the parts available for your car. You're going to have so much fun looking at car parts. So once more, go to rockauto.com. No promo code needed as their gimmicks... Just like Chris Candido, no promo code needed as their pricing is already that good. When you order, make sure to tell rockauto.com that you heard them right here on House of Hardcore Podcast. That's rockauto.com. Let's get back into it. Uh, do you have a, I don't want a great moment in impact wrestling for yourself? Um, yeah, yeah. There's been, there's been a handful of them, but I think that the two that, three there's three that stick out in my head big um rohit and i had a a feud that i enjoyed a lot and rohit is a guy that i used to backyard wrestle with so we have these like clips and pictures from various points in our careers but we are always doing them together and like going against each other so we have pictures and clips against each other in a backyard we have pictures and clips against each other on like small indie shows then pictures and clips of us against each other at ring of honor when we both got booked. And uh, uh, again, it was against each other. And then of course at impact. So there's like cool little parallels with that throughout. Um, another one was uh, actually fresh off of my feud with Cody. That felt like a good defining moment. And in that same episode, I had the title match with Moose. So it was just like the whole, like 
from going from sometimes not being booked and if if me and cody are booked it's like sparsely you know right um to not having like any tv time to in one episode having roughly 25 minutes ab- about me was pretty cool um and i loved the matches and the story and everything um and then the other big one was probably my match with uh josh alexander for the x vision title i felt like that was a big breakout moment for me so people yes. could actually see, you know see what i can do and see what i'm made of um and just all of it um i think i think it's by far my longest match on impact as well and jo- josh is in my opinion i think josh is the best wrestler in the world right now um so like he can have a good match with anybody but like i i was hanging with him and people still talk about it so it that's 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 up there with one of my favorite moments for sure uh, I agree, uh, especially with you and Josh, as well as Josh being one of the best wrestlers in the world. Hopefully he comes back to impact. I know mm-hmm. there's, uh, some issues going on there. Um, f- let me ask you this one. And, uh, there's a lot of wrestlers that listen to this. I wish you would have told creative about all these moments of you and Rohit because, it would have made it a bigger deal and would have been presented mm-hmm. as a bigger deal. I think we did. Okay. Well, I didn't, I wasn't that part <laughs> of it because the fact that they didn't show that is boo on them. Mm-hmm. Dude. I remember Terry Funk versus Tommy rich in the ECW arena. Mm-hmm. They come back and they're like, Tommy rich, like, that was pretty good. And Terry Funk was like, yeah, it was pretty good. You know, thanks. And then they're like, you know, we were like, oh, man, that was awesome. Like, the boys were watching it. And then they're like, yeah, first time we ever worked. And we're like, what? And Tara's like, yeah, that was the first time we ever wrestled each other. And we're like, wait a minute. How has Tommy Rich and Terry Funk never worked together? Two former NWA champions. And they were like, well, when I was in Georgia, Terry wasn't there. And they never touched. And we were like, why didn't you tell? Paul was like, why didn't you tell me that? Mm-hmm. Because we would have promoted that the first time ever, blah, 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 blah. So the fact that you did that now, I'm mad at whoever was in, it was probably Don Callis. <laughs> you probably told Don, hence why he was fired. They they had a, a video package. And I remember like we did like some promos back and forth and especially Ro, he, he, he touched on it, but I know we sent them pictures and stuff. I don't remember if they were used on the package or not. I'd have to go back and watch it, but yeah, they definitely, probably could have showed more of that (laughs) well i can't listen i gotta go on a creative meeting after this i'm gonna heal them i don't even know if any (laughs) member is still on the team but i'm gonna heal them for that happening uh but if you're telling me they did use it then i'm gonna look like an ass but uh, scott yell you know this scott yells at me more just like you he yells at us yeah yeah it'll just be another day um upcoming for you you have you're facing Trey Miguel, yep, at uh, the pay per view, mm-hmm. right? That will, will you say that will be you know one of your bigger matches? You and you and Trey yeah. have wrestled before, correct? Yes, um, never on Impact though. He, I'm sure we're going to see a different side of him as well as a different side of you. Here's the the uniqueness of you. I've watched you work as a big man. Mm-hmm. I have watched you work as like an X division luchador where a guy your size shouldn't be doing the things that you do. Mm -hmm. Um, That's why you're very, very versatile worker. And I love, love, love when you do your gigantic dive over the top rope. Yeah. Uh, Except for when people don't catch you. I don't like that. Or when you overshoot the pile and you just (laughs) caveman up. I have to make sure I don't give it my all. Cause that, that (laughs) (laughs) I had one, one clip where, um, it happened years ago, but I, I mean, I was coming in hot and I definitely cleared the guy and he did his best, but I just sailed over him. And it's like moments before I'm about to probably break my neck, but like, you know, I tuck and roll. So I was like pretty proud that I was able to do that, but it's one of the clips that Jim Cornette got a hold of. And, you know, so obviously he had a little bit of field day with it, but honestly, I feel like that just makes me more professional that I stopped myself from dying. Yeah, man, you're still here. <laughs> And it, it does suck when you overshoot or listen, I learned in WWE, I, 
in ECW, I would do dives, but I would also dive on people that I know would always catch me. Uh, mm -hmm. That has become, it's one of, we all have our pet peeves. That's one of Tommy Dreamer's massive pet peeves of you not catching somebody. If you overshoot the pile, I get it. That's on yeah. you. But if I learned real quickly, there was a lot of alligator arm wrestlers in the <laughs> WWE because they don't want to get hurt. And then the moment, yeah. but if you're going to be a diver and, or you have to know that that person's going to be there. And if you're going to dive, that person needs to pay you the same respect. If not, I'm going to let you fall to your, your death as well. I mean, that, yeah. I mean honestly, it never, dude, it was never like that. ECW, like there would be, we would pride ourselves on catching people like all of us. I mean, you go mm -hmm. back, there's a famous clip of Mike awesome, who you remind me of as well, diving over the top rope and JT Smith to try to catch him literally bent in half over the guardrail. Cause he was going mm -hmm. over the guardrail uh, and he caught him and it looked like he almost broke his back, but we took pride. That was that generation. Yeah. Um, I once had to take a Masato Tanaka, uh, the, a, a dive, a, uh, Mike Awesome dive, and then a 380-pound bully Ray dove oh. over the top rope, overshot the pile, and I grabbed his uh, his overalls and pulled him on top of me. And he or else, and he was like, "Thank you, bro. Thank you." And he was going to wipe out and kill himself. He was just yeah. sailing. It was all three in a row. Oh, and I took Terry Funk's moonsault. Oh, sweet! Worst <laughs> day for me ever. It was in Japan. <laughs> Terry's my partner. He moonsaults. It was on me and I think Devon. Boom. But I had to catch him because his moonsault was very, very, uh, it was deceptive. You think he would like shoot and he was going to be like super crazy, elegant and graceful. And then he would just start falling to the earth and we mm -hmm. can't let Terry Funk crash and burn. Oh. So I ate his knees. Devon ate his belly. And then here came Masato Tanaka with a suicide dive. I had to get up, eat that. And he overshot Terry. And then here came Bull, no, uh, Mike Awesome goes flying over the pile. And I'm just selling because I'm trying to still get my brains together after I ate Terry and Masato <laughs> Tanaka. And then here comes the fat man, Bully. And I seriously, man, I remember him sailing over and I was like, God damn it. And I just grabbed his <laughs> and pulled him on top of me. It felt like I pulled a Volkswagen right on top of me. <laughs> But that was our generation because if not, you went to the locker room and I have, when you say going to court, there was a lynch mob. You can miss a guy once. If you did it twice, you would either be told if you miss him again, you're going to come back here and everyone's going to beat you up. Yep. And that's how it should be because yeah. you can die. You can, if it's not your fault or, or also you and I are working. Do you know how many times like I had to tell Rob Van Dam, Hey man, after the first few, his front helo, I would tell him all the time, Rob, I have to stop taking that because your ass is crushing me uh -huh. or I'm hitting my head on the concrete or I'm catching you and then getting hurt going into the guardrail because he, it's science, man. It's speed, velocity, and weight. Yeah. And I'm the person who's stopping it. And he's and a big dude too. This, nobody realizes how deceptively thick Rob yeah. Van Dam is. And he's Big also torso. can be at times graceful, but on that front helo, there's nothing you can do. Mm -hmm. I remember some dudes not catching him and literally Rob going, dude, and then fixing his ponytail because <laughs> he's also super tough. <laughs> anyway, um, so you and Trey, you're obviously mm -hmm. looking forward to that match. And if you win, you'll be the champ. If you lose, you'll be uh, uh, another day for you wherever you uh, are you uh, two things before I let you go. One, you had, uh, I remember reaching out to you because now through the years we've become friends. Cause also like I, I told you, like I see greatness in you and I kind of always want to see greatness uh, in you. One, I remember texting you about a floods that were hitting your area. Yes. As a fellow Michigander, I now live there, but I do have homes there. And I was like, where the hell did this happen? Uh, did your house get all messed up because of that? No, it was literally like one block away. It was like, all right, if one, uh, cause a dam broke and then I'm trying to remember, I think there was either two dams that broke or just one, but there was three dams total and the other two were compromised or something like that. And it was like, all right, well, the floods are right up 
to like a block away from me. Like I walked over and well, you know, was videotaping it and stuff like that. And I've got dogs and stuff. And I was like, all right, well, you know, how, how am I supposed to get out of here with my dogs? So uh, it was one of those things where it was like, if, if one of these goes south, I have like an exit plan pretty much of uh, where to go and how to get out of there. But even like, I tried to go see my parents um, uh, during that. And I wasn't able to get to them. I tried every route I could think of and the, the roads were all flooded to where I just could not get to them. They were like on an Island pretty much. I remember seeing the pictures on, on Twitter and everything. And then when I saw you were there, I was like, Holy shit, dude, like that's scary stuff. Like, especially in any type of, it was a disaster, a natural disaster. Mm -hmm. When any type of stuff happens, that helplessness. And then, yeah, you worry, here's the beauty of some people worry about themselves. Here's the beauty of you. You worry about your parents and your dogs before you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I'm glad that worked out. Cause I had thought your house had gotten all fucked up because of it, mm -hmm. but I'm happy that did your parents house get messed up? No, I mean, uh, that house is already uh, kind of a, a loss anyways, but no, it didn't. <laughs> wow. Uh, lastly, you, you recently just posted and, uh, I got to commend you for it uh, about mental health. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't talk about it. A lot of people talk about um, they view it as a weakness or, Hey, we're these big tough wrestlers yet. We don't uh, you know, we don't talk about certain things and you put, po you posted something about mental health and here I am with you. I kind of remember I'm, you know, joking with you. I see you. And I always say this, you never know what else, what's going on with other people. And from a really, really traumatic event, you had to deal with it and cope with it. And not a lot of people knew about it, especially at your workplace, but you were very, very open and honest and put that out there. But also I feel you gave others hope. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to talk about, you know, what happened if you don't want to, I'm just saying like, like, cause you said this was going on for a long time with you. Yes. Yeah. Um, just in general, like, you know, even growing up, like, you know, we, I always, I always have the mindset of like, wow, things suck. Wow, this hurts. I feel horrible, this or that. But there's always somebody that has it, that has it worse. So like, that's kind of one of the things I always try to keep in mind. Um, and then over the last, like, uh, time is like a blur right now, but maybe the last couple of years, I just had like a series of very horrible things. And, uh, and like my dad committing suicide was like the, the icing on the cake, so to speak. Um, and just all everything that came with it. And I was very much, you know, trying to, trying to keep it in, um, for, for a lot of reasons, really. Um, and then I didn't realize, like, I knew I was hurting, but I didn't realize how it was affecting me in a lot of different ways, like within friendships, relationships, the way I viewed things or anything like that. Um, and then it kind of all hit me. And then I was really feeling, you know, when you push everything away for too long and then it, you know, when it comes yeah. up, it comes up. Um, so then I had like crazy fluctuations with my, my weight, like where I eat a lot. I'm a guy that eats a lot anyways, but I remember during Russell house, I accidentally weighed like 269 pounds because I was eating on top of what I already eat anyways. I was eating Taco Bell and McDonald's both every single day for like a long time because it was just, you know, I get sad. I eat. That's uh, That was a thing. And then I had the opposite side of that depression of where I couldn't eat and I couldn't sleep. And I lost like 20 or 25 pounds or something like that. And then I kind of had to check myself. I realized something, you know, I, I realized a lot was wrong. So I started going to therapy and like writing in a journal and stuff like that. Um, and like, I guess, opening up to my friends more. And then when I made that post, like on that day, it was, it was kind of supposed to be like a hopeful thing because like, I didn't set out like, Hey, I want to write this like, on this day or anything like that. I literally pulled up to the gym and I was like, kind of getting in the zone and listening to some music. Like I was listening to some, some heavy metal. That's like empowering, I guess you could say. And I was just feeling it. And I, you know, so I just started writing. Um, and then I was like, I feel like this could be good for somebody to know that like, just cause it's dark right now, it don't, it won't always be like, 
you don't have to hide it. Like being strong isn't hiding it. Being strong is being open with it. So I, I felt like maybe just maybe if there was somebody that was feeling like me, that that would be hope for them. Cause I finally felt like I was in a good place to where I could say something like that. And it does. And it did. Um, were you surprised with the result or here's how I look at it. And like, I've had, I've had wrestlers. I've also had random strangers hit me up on social media and I'll be like, for me, it's always about find your happiness. When ECW went out of business, I was, I was a lost soul and I was wrestling and I had this appearance of a normal person. I had gone down to two thirty. I was doing double sessions of the gym because I was just like trying to, Oh, I'm going to go to the WWE. I'm being told I'm going to go to the WWE, but I was unemployed for seven months. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, you know, yes, always smiling, always super duper the image of being happy, but I wasn't happy. My world had crumbled, you know, same. Yeah. Another series of events had, you know, affected relationships had affected everything across the board, really, really bad stuff. And then I'm like, Hmm. Social media is not around back then, but for me, like I always reach out to people because I don't want people to feel alone or like you're in that same situation. Even when impact, if we bring in people who are there as extras security uh, or enhancement talent, like, mm -hmm. Hey guys, pretty much all of us started this way. And like, I know you don't want to be the person who gets beat up tonight, or I know you want to be the person who does security, but Hey, I was that person. Hey, Tasha Steeles was that person. Hey, Jake something was that person. And now look where he's at because yeah. he didn't mess up uh, his when he was given a little. And then when we're relying him to have a great match with Moose or, or a great match with Trey Miguel, he's going to do that. But like, it's a, it's a learning process. But for you, uh, putting yourself out there was, uh, was very, very noble. But also now that you're explaining even more why you did it is even great because you, you have a platform and you get to, I always say, man, use your platform for good because I think good things will happen to you as well as like, just like you just said it, you didn't want people to think like, Hey, somebody else could be going through the same thing. And if yeah. you, if one, you could have the world telling you you're an asshole, but if one person says, Hey man, you uh, help, help me. You, you did that, but I don't think anyone was calling you an asshole. I, I hope not, but <laughs> I, I guess I wouldn't really care too much if they did. No, but no I, I had, yeah, but I had like, you know, I, again, I didn't, I didn't, you know, send the tweet thinking like, oh, this is going to blow up. But like, you know, I, I actually, I sent it and then I put it on, um, like I, I turned my notifications off just because I was like, all right, it'll, it'll probably be a thing, but I'm going to go work out and whatever. Uh, I didn't, you can't really expect it to like take off as much as it did, I guess you could say. Um, but cause there's just, you know, there's a lot of friends and uh, mutuals and people that I kind of know, or some people I didn't know that were messaging me or commenting and things like that. And it felt really good. There was for me, cause I kind of get overwhelmed sometimes. It was like too many to like even process right then. Um, so like, I almost couldn't even reply to any of them because it was like, Oh, you know, holy shit. But uh, like a lot of the messages, personal messages I tried to get back to. Um, but yeah, I, it felt, felt good to know that I was able to help some people. And uh, even though I wasn't posting it as like, um, Hey, I hope somebody reaches out to me too. There was a lot of people that reached out to me as well. I was like, Oh, that, that's cool too. Like it just, it was a good feeling all around. Um, and again, I don't think I've ever opened up about, anything i mean you ask a lot of my girlfriends i was not doing that for a long time so uh it was a it you're was a shallow <laughs> yeah what are you a robot <laughs> uh, yeah i had a lot uh it was a big moment for me um how old are you uh 32 uh i gave my 20s to ecw i want to say i gave my 30s to wwe when I was probably 35, I probably had gone to 40 funerals wow. of wrestlers that didn't make 
40. Yeah. And at one point it was like every other week somebody was dying. And then there was a lot of suicides as well. Uh, you know, and I was just like, you become immune to it or you're, you're literally saying, uh, well, he was a good person, but like, I don't have frequent flyer miles to go to that person's wake or because I already just used them last week. And I don't know if I could afford to. So, and yes, you become immune to them, uh, which I'm so happy. There's a whole generation of people that doesn't know what that feels like. Yeah. Where it's on such a heavy, heavy level. It sucks, dude. But the fact that you were able to do that and no, I love the fact that we talk more about mental health uh, as athletes. And I also, I, I think there has a lot to do with head trauma, um, why we feel that way. Yeah, uh, I'm that, sure. That'll be for, uh, I don't think I'll be here when all that happens. But I think when you're in your 50s, knocking on 60s, that there'll be a lot more answers for why that happens you you see it more with you know within football with cte and all that yeah so and and, you know we don't wear helmets and we take a lot of a head trauma i do know that the front of your head um is where emotions they say are stored Mm -hmm. and i think like from a lot of chair shots like something's wrong with my emotions they're either super duper turned off and then when I could talk about wrestling or moments, I start bawling, crying. Yeah. Like, but like, I'll be like, I'm not, I don't know if I'm really sad about this, but why am I crying? It's weird. Yeah. Yay. Wrestling. <laughs> but again, kudos to you to open up and I'm happy that you're in such a, a better place as well as I'm happy that you gave hope to other people. And it, it's, I was super duper like, impressed as well as like man i'm happy this guy's my friend because i just i love shit like that i really do yeah anyway um any goals coming up for you uh, x division to title gym today <laughs> x division title is a pretty big goal um that's uh, that's top top of the list for sure and uh how can people follow you on social media uh at jake something underscore that's the one. It's on Twitter and Instagram. I don't have a Facebook, so. So you mean to tell me that there's another Jake something and he took, uh, so you had to go to Jake something underscore? I think so, if I remember wow. correctly. Think if I that. remember correctly. <laughs> you have a hard time with your memory, dude. You got to start reading. <laughs> or you say you're writing journals. I'm going to tell you this as an older veteran. Start frigging writing down all your matches so you can remember shit. That's that's a thing I'm sad I never did because I have friends that have done that. So they're like, yeah, they, they have like an archive of like 500 or however many matches they have. Here's the ECW book, bro. Wow. See, that's awesome. I wish I would have done that because there's times where people be like, hey, remember that one time we wrestled? I'm like, mm, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> Here's ECW and WWE up until... Two thousand and eleven, then I have another book. That's so awesome. Yep. My life documented. And now I'm gonna put a <laughs> Jericho book one day. It's just all my stats and figures. All right. Well, uh, I want to say thank you for uh, being a guest on this week's House of Hardcore podcast. Uh hopefully you I like Trey too, so maybe go to a time limit draw because I don't want to see either guy lose. But again, all thank right. you uh for uh coming on this week's episode of the House of Hardcore Podcast. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me.